here we are again, following immediately of the from the previous video of uh, laying out and marking the cloth, translating the the measurements to the cloth. Remember in a previous uh, in a previous lesson, I laid out and I laid out and struck. That is to say, marked both aprons and also the deep pleat up beside each apron, and I've determined where my first and my last pleat will be. My next stage is to mark the first and second pleat, and to that, our total length, referring to my sheet, total length is 25, so I mark down 25. And this is, this is interesting because cloth isn't, working with cloth isn't like machining a, a piece of billet aluminum. There's going to be, it's an organic, literally organic medium, and as such, there's going to be variances along the length of a piece of cloth. Just here, only a meter away, <clears throat> I had to adjust down a little bit, or I decided to adjust down a little bit to make my top of the kilt coincide with the edge of that, the division between the black and the green. A meter away, that same measurement puts me bang on the mark. So don't get too terribly frustrated when you run into this yourself. Okay, so I measure down 25. I'm going to measure up that eight inches and frustratingly that hasn't changed it's still a half an inch away from the mark which i'm going to extend it down that half inch and then i'm going to measure my third measurement two and a half there this is the center of the buttonhole this is the line that the straps and the buttons will be centered on so i take a template i'm big on templates um i take a strap a, a kilt strap which i've kept for this purpose because this was made by one of my suppliers during that very special time that they made the straps either far too light or far too heavy this thing is verging on bulletproof um i mean the last forever but geez also so what i do is i take it and i line up the holes if you can look down and see see i line up the holes so i can see that shock mark there's my buttonhole I'm going to do the same thing. That's the first pleat. I'm going to repeat the same process on the second pleat because when I'm sewing, when I start sewing, I'm going to sew down to a little bit short of that mark because we want this hole to have a bit of play. We don't want to be a tight fit of the strap. We don't want to have to pull the strap through. We don't want any friction because that will erode this cloth in a fairly short order so we want a little bit of wiggle room so when I'm, I'm I'm marking this now so that when I'm sewing this first seam I get to here I do several overcasts and then I and I bypass this and then I sew the rest of it so I'm, I'm marking this now so let's do the same thing again I need a tape that has the same measurement from each end okay bring it down to there once again, and you notice I've got a piece of hobby styrene underneath as a to provide a stable writing surface because this table of mine is well over 100 years old and it seems considerable on use and it's a bit bumpy. So it just it makes it for a more accurate mark. I'm going to be doing something similar when I start sewing so that my needles aren't gouging the cloth. Okay, I center it again. I mark it again. So there's our buttonhole marked. Where it's going to be now to determine the pleat width i at some point i decided to make again i'm big on gauges and jigs and things i had this cedar veneer red cedar veneer i have no idea where it came from and what i did was it's constant thickness i marked all of them to well okay that one's a little over but they're all generally two and a half inch. That one's a little short. That one's a little long. So <laughs> they're all at around two and a half inches. If I was as smart, I should take the time and reduce them all to the same length because that's a very quick way to mark where your where the, the end of the taper is. Because remember, on a man's kilt, in fact, back up, back up a bit. Um, yeah, on a man's kilt, it starts wide at the hip, tapers to the point um, at the center of the strap and then continues parallel from that on. With a women's kilt, the taper is constant throughout its length. So by having this two and a half inches long, it's very easy for me just to slap it in place against the top of the kilt and make the mark. Um, so 
so I've made all of these uh, these gauges, and as you can see, three quarters plus, which tells me that it's well, it's a sixteenth over two inches. That must have been for one of my hunting kilts, one and an eighth, eleven sixteenths. So I pulled out a couple. One is seven eighths, and one is fifteen sixteenths, fourteen sixteenths, fifteen sixteenths. And I'm just going to double check. I'm going to calibrate my gauges up here on the the waist part of the cloth. It isn't waist because this is going to provide the top uh, the top band. And what I do is with my sharp piece of chalk, I make a mark and I check it. It doesn't have to be centered on that piece. I just did it out of reflex, and I check to my tape. So this is seven eighths. It's seven eighths if measured to the inside of the chalk line. Okay. So if, to do this, because accuracy counts here, seven eighths is, is between the chalk line. If I measure outside the chalk line, <clears throat> oh, look at that, 15 16. So I can put that one away. And I'll stick that away in a minute. So to mark my pleats, I go down to the bottom. And I mark, there's the bottom of my pleat. Now here at the top, see, you notice I've got a, a center line mark there so I can gauge it. You should also, you can pretty much do it by eye, but I added that center mark. Um, there we are. So this tells me, and let's do it on the next one because I'll, do, I'll just pin it up just to show you. And you'll notice I didn't bother chalking on this side because other kilt makers will start by sewing the front apron to the first pleat and then carrying on. I sew all of the pleats and then I do the apron work. And there's a couple of reasons for that, which I'll, uh, which I'll mention later if I remember. I will. Okay, so there we are, first and second pleat. Now that remains the same. The reason, again, the reason why I extended the length of the fell from eight inches to about eight and three eighths down to that mark is it's far more reliable to measure when I'm sewing, to start my sewing at a tr transition rather than having to measure each down, measure each of them, each of them down. If, when there are occasions when it's a very simple tartan and this, or it's so very busy that I might make a mistake, I'll use that gauge. And let's just, ex let's, let's imagine, although look, it actually turns out, let's imagine that the bottom of my sewn portion Turns out, having just measured it out of curiosity, oh, look at that, it's seven eighths of an inch. I could find this part on each of my pleats by just putting that same gauge, in this case, the same gauge. You might have to use a different gauge, but use a gauge, line it up, make sure I'm not using parallel, falling victim to parallax, so I'm looking down. Okay. Now, yeah, so later on, this will be pinned up. Um, I'll explain that quickly now, just because this fellow has been more than patient with his kilt. And I'm going to start working on this this afternoon, and I'm not going to keep harassing my videographer to drop what he's doing and come down and see. So during the process, during the, the progress of this series of, of this video series, this, this instructional series on how to make a kilt start to finish, it might well turn out that the tartan, <laughs> I'm suddenly working on a different tartan because I'm working on a different kilt. So later on when I pin it up, now again, because I'm a lefty and for, I, I sew left-handed, I never learned how to do the traditional cr sit with your legs crossed, piece of cloth clamped in your legs, stretched tight and sewing thing. And I'm not going to bother explaining it more than that because I never learned how to do it and I'm probably never going to. My, my apprentice does it that way and it works fine for him. So as you saw, when I pinned it up, I pin, my first pin goes in at the center of the, the buttonhole, the second pin there. And then when these two, when those two pins are in, I stretch this a bit tight. Now remember, this measurement's seven eighths. So I've arranged, I've pinned it up so that the chalk mark is out of sight. So I got seven eighths. Up here, do you remember I have to add a 16th of an inch in this particular kilt? So in this case, I'm measuring to the outside of the chalk lines and that's how I'm pinning it. And then having stretched it tight again, I can put in a fourth pin, like so. Now, if I was sewing this kilt 
I shouldn't have done that. I'll have to clean those out later. If I was, if I was going to be sewing this kilt so that it was pleated to the set, I would check by doing by chalking every one of the pleats because you can quickly run into trouble if you're not absolutely sure before you start. Pleating to the stripe is relatively straightforward. So having done this, I don't feel the need to mark all the rest of the pleats because I can, from here, my next stage is to rip this down and then start sewing. Because I know that over here, when I finally sew and I come up against a pleat marked with an X, I know that's my last pleat, right? So I don't have to, I don't have to do all of that. The next stage, which leads us ready to actually start sewing the thing, is one more thing. <coughs> Pardon me. Remember, I'm going to be using this leftover bit of cloth for the top band. So at the center of the apron, I marked that so that later on I'm, I'm lining these, these because this, this, I'm going to be separating these, rolling this up in a ball. Later on, when the time comes to put the top band on, I'm marrying the same piece of cloth to itself. Because you'll find, even over a couple of repeats, that these distances will be slightly more or slightly less. So that minimizes the chances of that. Because across the front of the apron, at least, we want it to match as near perfectly as possible. So I've checked my numbers. I've checked my drawing, my measurements. I'm confident. Because this, this next part is the big step. This is the, the part that still sometimes makes me want to stop and go have a cup of coffee first or something and relax. Because this is the irrevocable step in which, and see, I still find myself with an excess of caution, 25 inches. I make the cut. Incidentally, I never, never, never lay scissors down on the cloth because your instinctive way to pick the scissors up is by the handle, and if they're even slightly open, snip, and you've just thrown away $1,000 worth of cloth, or at least injured it. Okay, 1200 actually, these days. So I've made my, my initial incision. I'm confident that my chalk marks are all good. And here's the part that once brought my wife flying down the stairs because she thought I'd lost my mind and was having a, some sort of tantrum because we do this. This is the best way to do, to separate this cloth because a rip will continue straight along one fiber. If you cut, it's never going to be completely straight. I get to the end and it's funny, I saw dust flying in the air and I can smell a slight scorch smell. So I have to think that the action of ripping it is causing some sort of combustion. I don't know. Um, we'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, we're not going to tape the whole thing, but what I'm immediately going to do now is roll this into a nice little ball and put it to one side. And uh, thus endeth this particular lesson. Thank you.